Hello everybody and welcome to this GCSE chemistry video about atomic structure and in this video we will take a look at what is inside atoms and how those particles are arranged. We will look in more detail at the subatomic particles protons, neutrons and electrons and what some of their properties are. Then we'll look at the atomic number and mass number that you can get from the periodic table and how to use them and what those numbers means. And then we will look at how the electrons are arranged in an atom and last of all, we will finish by looking at isotopes. First, let's take a look at the structure of the atom. Now, the word atom comes from the Greek word atomos, which means indivisible or uncuttable. And that symbolizes the fact that for thousands of years, scientists thought that an atom was the smallest particle that there was, and you couldn't cut it any further, you couldn't divide it any further. We now know that that's not true because we know that atoms, when you break them apart, have got three particles inside them called subatomic particles, and they are the proton, neutron, and electron. And you find the protons and neutrons in the nucleus of the atom, which is the center of the atom. And then orbiting around the nucleus, a bit like planets orbiting the sun, you find electrons. And the electrons, the path that the electrons follow, are called shells, or sometimes called energy levels. Subatomic particles are absolutely tiny, so how heavy each individual particle is, is really hard to get your head around. And so what we do, which is much easier, is we compare how heavy they are to each other. And protons and neutrons have the same mass, and so we give that number 1, because it's very easy to use the number 1 and visualise it in our heads. So the mass of a proton is one and the relative mass of a neutron is one. Electrons are about 2,000 times smaller than a proton and a neutron and so their mass is either we could call it one over 2,000 or we could call it zero because it is almost so small that it doesn't have any mass. And so these are the relative masses of the three particles. And so what you notice there is that all of the mass is actually found in the nucleus with the protons and the neutrons and the electrons, which make up actually most of the space of an atom where you find the electrons, but actually doesn't contain very much mass at all. Then the second property that you need to know about for these subatomic particles is their charge. Now, neutrons are neutral, which means they, doesn't, they don't have any charge. But protons are positive, which is a nice alliteration to help you remember. And the electrons are negative. And so protons positive, electrons negative, neutrons neutral. Now, in atoms, you always find the same number of protons as you find electrons. And because they've got opposite charges, what that means is that overall, atoms do not have any charge. And one last fact about atoms and their basics is that for any given element, all atoms of that element have got the same number of protons. So pick any atom, let's pick hydrogen, because it's the smallest, it's got one proton. And that means that all the atoms of hydrogen will have one proton. All atoms of carbon have got six protons. More about that later. The periodic table is a fantastically useful tool and the great news is you get to take it into the exam with you so you will always have a periodic table for a chemistry exam. The power of the periodic table is particularly obvious when we're looking at atomic structure. Now the elements in the periodic table are arranged in groups so let's look at group one here with hydrogen and so First up, we notice that we have got a symbol. So all the elements have got a symbol. So there is the symbol for hydrogen. And then the second element is helium. And what you'll notice is that the symbols only have got one capital letter and one lowercase letter. Then you'll notice the numbers. And let's just kind of take hydrogen out of the periodic table now. And so we've got the symbol and we've got the two numbers. Now, the smaller of the two numbers, which for hydrogen, there isn't one, but it's the bottom number usually, is called the atomic number, or sometimes it's called the proton number. And very literally, the atomic number or proton number tells us the number of protons that there are in a particular atom. And so for hydrogen, it's got the atomic number of one, which means it's got one proton. The mass number, or usually its more formal name is the relative atomic mass, is the top number in the periodic table. It's the larger of the two. 
And so the mass number tells you how many things there are in the atom that have got mass. And that is the number of protons added to the number of neutrons, because those are the two particles in the atom that have got mass. And so for hydrogen, the number of protons plus the number of neutrons is equal to one, because that's what the mass number is. And so because we know that it's got one proton, there's its proton here, then the number of protons, one, plus the number of neutrons equals one. And so that means that the number of neutrons must equal zero, because one plus zero equals one, and that must mean it's got zero neutrons in an atom of hydrogen in its nucleus. And if we do the same thing for helium, helium's got an atomic or proton number of two, that means it's got two protons. And four is its relative atomic mass, which means that the protons plus the neutrons equals four. Well, if we've got two protons, then we must have two neutrons because that's how you make four. And so overall, the rule for how you work out neutrons is that it is the relative atomic mass take away the atomic number. And so if we picked a different element, um, so if we picked aluminium, which is here, which has got the numbers 27 and 13, that means that aluminium has got 13 protons and it's relative atomic mass is 27, that means it's got 27 things in its nucleus. We know that 13 of them are protons, so that neutrons is 27, take away 13, which is 14. That's how many neutrons we've got. And we can always do a double check that we've not gone wrong, because 13 plus 14 does add together to make 27. And so if we just checked one last one, just to make sure that we're happy with this, potassium has got the numbers 19 and 39. That means that it's got 19 protons, and then it's got 39, take away 19, gives us 20 neutrons. So that's how the periodic table tells us about protons and neutrons. The last thing, remember what we said on the previous page, is that protons and electrons are equal for an atom, and that's because the positives and the negatives cancel each other out, and so overall atoms have got no charge. And so that means that since potassium had 19 protons, it will have 19 electrons as well. Um, what did we say? Aluminium had 13 protons, it also has 13 electrons as well. And same for helium. Helium had two protons, it would have two electrons as well. And so that's how you can use the periodic table as a tool to work out the number of protons. That's just simply the bottom number. Electrons, that's the same. And neutrons, which is the top number, take away the bottom number. Paying a bit more attention to electrons now, we're going to look at the electron arrangement, which is sometimes called the electron configuration or sometimes called the electronic structure. But what all of these mean is where do we find the electrons in the atom? Now, we already know that we find the electrons in shells, which are also referred to as energy levels. And the thing about energy levels is that all atoms have got them. Some of them are filled for an atom, not very many normally, and there's always one on the outside that is considered to be the outer shell. And so the question is, where do the electrons go? Well, the rule number one is that you fill up from the central shell and work outwards once that shell is full. So you have to fill each shell before moving on to the next. And so the question is, how many electrons can each shell hold? Well, the first shell can hold two electrons and then it's full. The second shell can hold eight electrons and then it's full. And the third shell can hold eight electrons and then it's full. It gets a little bit more complicated after that, but the good news is for GCSE level, you'll only have to go up to 20 electrons, which will mean that you'll only have to go up to the fourth electron shell and you won't have to go any further. So if we consider the element carbon, which has got six electrons, what that means is that we've got six electrons to, to fill into these shells and we put them in the first shell and we normally, there's kind of like a convention that we draw them as X's to represent the electrons, but you can use dots as well, but because I did my nucleus as a dot, I'm going to draw my electrons as crosses. So the first shell holds two and then it is full. So we have to move on to the second shell. And the second shell, so we've obviously got four left because six take away those two leaves us with four. So we put them, and again, there's like a kind of convention that we put them at the compass points, northeast, south, west on there. 
And so that's my six electrons filled. And so carbon doesn't actually have uh, an outer shell. And so you wouldn't actually draw that third shell for carbon. And what you would write, because it's got six electrons, we know that these numbers are going to add up to six, but you write what's called the electron configuration, which is two comma four. And that is two electrons in the first shell and then four in the second shell. So when you see it listed two comma four, that tells you how many electrons there are in each shell. And so if I take um, potassium that we've already looked at, 19 electrons, well then it's going to have two in the first shell, like carbon, and then if we move on to the next shell that can hold up to eight, I'm going to take over my carbon picture and draw this as potassium. So that's now full for potassium. It's got 19 protons, I should have said that, I'm sure you followed that. It's got two in the first shell, eight in the next, and then it's going to have eight in the next one, and because we're still not filled all the way up with our electrons, because two and eight and eight is 18, we need one last one in the outer shell, which I'll draw freehand like this, and that's now filled. And so the electron configuration is just simply a list of how many electrons in each shell. So two in the first, eight in the second, eight in the third, and one in the fourth shell. And the fourth shell for potassium is considered to be the outer shell, whereas for carbon, because it had fewer shells, the second shell was considered to be the outer shell with four electrons in. And you can do this with any element, but don't practice with the crazy big elements because you only need to do up to the 20th element, and it does get a little bit complicated after that. I mentioned that you need to know the electron arrangement for the first 20 elements, so I've written it out here for your ease of reference, but also I've written it out to make one extra link before we move on, and that is the link between group number and electron arrangement, and period number and electron arrangement. Now the groups are the columns, the up and down parts of the periodic table. And so this is group one, group two, then we've got the transition metals in the middle, then we've group three, four, five, six, seven, and usually called group zero, sometimes called group eight. And so what I want you to notice here is that the electron arrangement of all the elements in a group ends with the group number. And so the group number is the number of electrons that an element has got in its outer shell with the exception of group zero, because that zero is representing the full shell of electrons that that element has got. All those noble gases have got the full shell. And then the next link is the period number. Now the periods are the rows, they go side to side. And so the period numbers go down the side. So this is period one, period two, period three, and period four. And the period number tells us how many occupied energy levels or shells there are. And so the first period has got one occupied energy level, the second period has got two occupied energy levels, and the third period has got three, etc. So I could tell you that I'm thinking of an element in group four, and you should be thinking, okay, it's got four electrons in its outer shell, and I'll say it's in period three, and you'll know that it's got three occupied shells with four electrons in the outermost shell. I've already said that atoms of the same element have got the same number of protons. So we looked at potassium just then. All elements of potassium will have 19 protons and 19 electrons. And they don't necessarily all contain the same number of neutrons. Protons and electrons is always the same, but neutrons can vary. And this is where isotopes come in. So isotopes have got the same number of protons and that is also the same as saying the same atomic number, but they will have different numbers of neutrons. And what that means as a consequence of that is they will have a different relative atomic mass or different mass number. So if we look at some examples, um, the most common example is probably chlorine. So I'll start with that. Chlorine has got an atomic number of 17, which means it's got 17 protons and 17 electrons. It's got a relative atomic mass of 35, and what that means is we can do 35 take away 17, which means it's got 18 neutrons. But there is actually a second type of chlorine atom, which is a little bit heavier. It's got 37 as its relative 
atomic mass. But it's got 17 as its atomic number, which means 17 protons and 17 electrons. But for its neutrons, you can do this very easily, but 37 take away 17 gives us 20 neutrons. And so isotopes are atoms of the same element, and we know they're the same element because they've got the same number of protons and electrons, but protons is key. But they've got a different number of neutrons, and that makes some of the isotopes a little bit heavier than the others. In terms of chemistry, in terms of specifically reactivity, because they've got the same electrons, actually their reactivity is going to be the same. Um, and that's because of the same number of electrons. So it's electrons that determines the reactivity of any given element. And so because they've got the same number of protons, they will have the same number of electrons, and so they will have the same reactivity. And so these two atoms of chlorine will have the same reactivity. And I'll give one example more of this, and I'll pick carbon because there's two different types of carbon that you experience in GCSE chemistry. There is actually a third, but it's less common. So there's carbon-12, which is by far the most common form of carbon. And using the numbers, it's got six protons and it's got six electrons. And using the relative atomic mass of 12, 12 take away six actually is six neutrons as well. So carbon-12 has got six of everything. Now, the next isotope that I want to mention is carbon-14. Now, carbon-14 is used in physics for carbon dating, so that's why I'm mentioning this one, uh, because it's a radioactive isotope. Now, it's got the atomic number of six, though, so it's still got six protons and it's got six electrons, but this time the neutrons is going to be 14 take away six, which is eight, and so a different number of neutrons. And so I've been calling them carbon-12 and carbon-14, and that refers to their mass number. So carbon-12 and carbon-14, and you can do that for any element that's got isotopes. The number that comes after it is the relative atomic mass of that particular isotope. I should say that chlorine in the periodic table is quoted as having a relative atomic mass of 35.5, and that's because the amounts of the chlorine-35 and chlorine-37 isotope are quite significant. They're both significant. And so 35.5 is the average mass of those two isotopes. Most elements that have got isotopes have got one that is massively dominant. And so that's why for carbon, we only see 12 in the periodic table because the vast majority of carbon atoms are carbon 12. But chlorine, you've got two significant isotopes and 35.5 is the average. Okay, that's the end of this video about atomic structure. We'll see you again next time for a summary about chemical bonding. See you then.